to Leaders of Tomorrow, India's largest platform for anything to do with the entrepreneurial world. I'm Sananda Jaya Seelan. On the show tonight, a special series that we call Eye on Dubai, focusing on the most innovative companies out of the Dubai UAE market. Tonight, the spotlight is on Data IQ. In our second segment, we're going to show you how you should be managing your wealth with our personal finance expert. All right, let's first then bring to you our special Eye on Dubai series, uh, talking about all the innovation and all the action taking place as far as the Dubai UAE market is concerned. Let's kick things off then by going over to Karen Osman, a reporter on the ground, joining us with this uh, interesting conversation as to what's really going on with Data IQ. Karen, over to you. Hi, Sananda. The UAE was the first in the world to appoint a Minister of State for Artificial Intelligence and in 2017 launched the strategy. As a result, there's a huge focus on AI in this region. Earlier, I had the opportunity to speak with Sid Bhatia, Regional Vice President for the Middle East and Turkey regions at Data IQ about the growth in AI and AI trends. What does Data IQ do and how does it differ from the competition? Data IQ is a leading platform for everyday AI. Right since our inception back in 2013 in Paris, we've been leading the space when it comes to innovation to the market. We operate in a segment called DSML, Data Science and Machine Learning Platforms, and we've been leading that space since 2013. What are the most common examples of AI in business? So it all starts with the C-level executives, to be honest. I mean, it starts with the initiatives that they're taking. And if you look at the business value drivers, across organizations, you'll see certain patterns. So it could be around reducing cost, increasing revenues, looking at new segments, new products, introducing new services to the market. It's very important to figure out first what the value drivers are and how many strong champions you have or really the change agents who want to really implement AI. It starts with that value, business value assessment at that level and it percolates down to use cases. At the end of the day, we're looking at multiple sectors. Uh, Data Echo is obviously a horizontal uh, kind of a play. So we look at multiple different uh, sectors and within each and every sector, the use cases could vary. So let me give you some examples here. So let's look at a sector that we're very, very strong in, which is financial services and insurance. And within the FSI sector, huge focus on customers. And the range of use cases vary from, you know, customer segmentation, micro segmentation, customer you know, churn analysis, you're looking at upsell and cross-sell models, you're looking at product recommendations, you're looking at use cases around next best action or the next best product, so on and so forth. And that's just to do with the customer analytics use cases. With a platform like Data Echo, what, what you figure out very quickly is that this can be applicable to multiple other domains as well. So for example, if you look at the risk departments, they're looking at anomaly detection, they're looking at risk forecasting, so on and so forth. If you look at other sectors outside of financial services, uh, which are equipment heavy, for example, the airlines in the region, or if you look at uh, you know, large manufacturing organizations, which are equipment heavy, uh, the use cases would differ. The use cases that take highest priority are basically use cases around predictive maintenance, supply negotiations, quality assurance, so on and so forth. Uh, but again, at the end of the day, if you have the data, you have the technology like Data Echo, and you have the intent to do it, you can deliver any use case on Data Echo. How does Data IQ address the ethical concerns of AI? So if you look at uh, what I've seen over the last 12 months to 18 months to 24 months, uh, from an organizational perspective, the prospects that we go after, uh, we clearly see a pattern emerging there where these organizations are coming up with blueprints around ethics. So they want to make sure that they are right on top and there's awareness created across the organization and everybody understands the meaning of ethics and the code and the baseline when it comes to that blueprint. So that's one aspect in organization. The other aspect also is around, you know, ethical committees being, uh, you know, being created everywhere. So we've seen a lot of uh, committees sort of come up uh, in multiple different organizations, which is a combination of the line of business manager, it could be a data scientist, it could be a business analyst, 
uh, it could be somebody right from outside. But I think they're setting the tone as far as any kind of ethics are concerned for the organization. We as Data Aiku are obviously technology vendors. So we have certain aspects built into the platform and we've always believed in the whole concept of white box AI, which means that uh, you need to have complete visibility of your data. I mean, machines are great, but you can't just hand over your data to the machines and let them decide. You need complete governance, complete audit, complete control. And this is where the DNA of Data Echo is around white box AI. Certain features within the platform I like to highlight uh, include what if analysis. We do have uh, you know, aspects around features and functionalities around you know, subpopulation analysis that really address that AI ethics concern very, very well. So when tough questions are asked, you need to have the right answers. Explainability is a key concept and something that data I could address is extremely well. What are the parameters of success for AI in business? Great question. I think it all starts with the business use cases. It's all about finding that right champion within the organization, a C-level executive who believes in AI and can sponsor that project. So that's point number one. Point number two is to identify the right use cases for the organization. And that could be around two parameters. Use cases that can create maximum impact and use cases that are quick, quick to deliver, which means that you can identify the top three use cases. Then you do internal assessment. Look at your skills, look at your people, look at what kind of training you might want to provide uh, the, the folks in the organization. And once that upscaling has happened, then you look at vendors externally, vendors like Data Echo who can apply, who can actually help you out with a lot of uh, domain experience and consulting around AI. Last but not the least, my recommendation is to start really, really, really small. You don't have to really go ahead with a big bang approach. Start small because less is more. And once you've actually implemented that first use case, that first win, communicate that internally. And that's how you start scaling AI within the organization. So the bottom line is have a strong champion, have a great use case, implement that, and then socialize that internally. The UAE was the first in the world to appoint a Minister of State for AI and in 2017 launched a strategy opportunities and challenges does this present? It's amazing to have this kind of leadership within uh, the UAE when you have leaders who have that vision, have that uh, mission and uh, have a clear strategy to execute. If you look at the AI blueprint for 2031, it clearly talks about a lot of initiatives within the Middle East. Uh, we recently had uh, the Golden Visa rollout, for example, which means that we're trying to attract talent here within the country so that you can start scaling AI. So this is a land of opportunities and there's, there's enough and more that's happening. One of the other initiatives that uh, I came across was the uh, coders initiative where you're looking at about 100,000 coders in the organization, uh, not in the organization, in, in the UAE. And at the same time, looking at 1,000 digital businesses uh, to be enabled in a very short span of time. So which means that the opportunities are immense. As far as challenges are concerned, challenges are more on the ground in the sense that uh, when you speak to data teams, and this has got nothing to do with Middle East, it's, it's a very generic phenomenon when you speak to data teams across the globe. Uh, people face challenges where uh, a particular organization does not embrace uh, the whole concept of AI or, or you know, challenges around, uh, for example, data quality or challenges around you know, not having the right infrastructure. But again, those can be managed. Uh, the bigger point is that this is a land of opportunities and there's so much that the leadership is doing to embrace it. What key trends are you seeing in AI across the Middle East region? Like I just said, I think uh, first trend is that the businesses are very aware here in the Middle East. They want to invest in AI. They understand very well that uh, a few years down the line, AI has to be your competitive weapon. Uh, so there are investments happening. So the first trend is there's a big market. The second trend when it comes to machine learning and AI is there's more involvement from business. So back in the day, we were just talking to the analytics team or we are just talking to the data science team, maybe a couple of people here and there. Now we see different people from different groups sort of contributing to AI. Which brings me to the third point and which is around inclusive AI, which means that it is becoming more inclusive, AI is becoming, becoming more democratized within the organization. So these are the general trends that are there, but specifically around the technology aspects, uh, three or four trends that I definitely see uh, emerging in the market is the movement around low code and no code. So more and more people uh, who do not have uh, you know, a, a scripting background or a coding background around R and Python and open source, they also want to contribute to AI. The other aspect, thanks to the pandemic or the post-pandemic situation is agility. So people want more agility, which means that people can work from anywhere at any time and they can still collaborate. Another key trend in that space is MLOps, which I think is the hottest topic right now. It's not about just the prototyping, it's about operationalization of models. How do you get those models into production with one click? How do you monitor those models? How do you set the operating targets, for example? So on and so forth. And 
Couple of other trends, uh, if I were to add uh, in, in, in a single breath would be around democratizing not just data science, but democratizing data quality. So do you have the ability to, you know, sort of roll it out to the organization where you have data from the last 20, 30, 40 years? Can you just click on that data, wrangle that data and get in the right format? Last but not the least is all about open source. So more and more companies are investing in open source and open source oriented platforms like DataEco that embrace open source in a big manner. So those are the general trends that I see in Middle East. AI is projected to be a 320 billion US dollar industry by 2030 in the Middle East. What advice do you have for anyone investing? Straightforward advice. Start with the best use case that you have for the organization. Involve your leadership team right on day one. Involve your business right on day one. The business teams need to start talking to the technical teams. There has to be a sense of collaboration within the organization. Once you've identified the high impact use case, uh, you need to sort of go ahead and implement that very fast. Once the implementation has been successful, you need to do what we call the business value assessment. Measure the value that you've created for the organization, then start socializing that with your peers within the organization, because that will ultimately create the momentum that's required. Last but not the least, uh, look at partners uh, like DataEco, who can actually supply the right technology, a technology that is open source oriented, is very robust, and is very complete and caters to everybody in the organization. As Dubai continues to focus on artificial intelligence, it's clear that there's a wealth of opportunities for new startups and established businesses alike. Back to you, Sananda. All right, Karen, thanks so much for that. Uh, let's take a quick break on that note. Balveer Chavla joining us on the other side, talking about tips to manage your money better. Back in just a moment. Welcome back with us here on Leaders of Tomorrow and Tonight in our segment where we show you how you should be managing your money better. We are in conversation with Balveer Chavla. He was part of a series of town halls that we do across the country, connecting face to face with entrepreneurs. My colleague Pooja Jen posed a few questions to him on how entrepreneurs like yourself or if you're just any Indian who's asking, how should I be managing my money better? Well, here are some answers for you. Balveer, you know, um, a question on the minds of many, right, for our audience members who I believe are really reconsidering some of their financial objectives, goals, and plans with respect to the future post-pandemic. What essentially distinguishes savings from investing? And how do these two strategies need to be both taken in parallel and yet viewed distinctly? Well, uh Savings is just one part of uh, what we set aside from the surplus that you have. So I'm earning 100 rupees, I spend 90 and I just keep aside 10 for a rainy day for something I may need in the future. Investing is something which comes a little more, which is generating much more better returns, generating or beating your inflation, trying to beat, uh, making it more tax efficient, getting more tax efficient returns. That is where probably investments fit into. People will always uh, mistake savings to be investments. And that has been a problem. Uh, again, I would go back to what uh, even Dr. Raman was saying. It is more of our mindset thought process. Okay, if I'm getting a guaranteed return or if I'm getting a safe return, it's more safe. And I don't want to take a risk. I want to just uh, you know, park it in my bank FD or maybe a low return as far as it is safe. And that is where saving is. You're just saving it aside. It's not beating your inflation. So you're getting something like a 3.5% on your uh, saving bank account. And uh, your inflation is at 5, 5.5%. So what are you gaining? You're losing money. And plus, you're paying a tax on that. So investments has to be looked in a different perspective as savings. So that's what would be the difference between a saving and investment. Absolutely, sir. And many companies that are perhaps in, in, in a very nascent stage are looking to 
raise capital by way of credit, right? You can see instruments as basic as credit cards funding the birth of companies, right? And one of the most common complaints with credit cards is these rewards and awards are lost in translation. It's, it's very difficult to understand how to cash in on them as a consumer or as a corporate. How might you uh, guide someone in that position or what more do you think the industry needs to do to simplify these credit features for the consumer? So credit cards, personally, I believe is a very good financial management tool. If your expenses are done on your credit card, you have a track of what you're expending and you know where you've spent money. You know what your limit is, you can set your limits. People have always used as credit cards as a tool to uh, you know, leverage themselves. They've always gone into a debt trap because of that, because they have not used it judiciously. But if you're using a credit card judiciously, believe me, there's no other better financial management tool where you get a track of, at the end of the month, you get a complete track of what expenses I have done, whether it is hotel, whether it is petrol, whether it is uh, entertainment, what it is. I can get a clear-cut bifurcation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and companies are coming up with reward points, you get cashbacks, you get uh, other incentives. If you know how to use them judiciously, you can really make good use of them. So you can practically have a credit card by not paying anything and get the best of features with the airport lounges and uh, other stuff coming free of cost to you always. Well, speaking of leveraging features judiciously, right? Uh, I think one commonly misunderstood term is the concept of a credit score, right? And the benefits that it can have uh, in terms of, you know, down the road, for, for example, you might receive an offer on a loan or more favorable terms, et cetera, et cetera. But I think a credit score is often uh, put on the back burner, so to speak. So at what age and stage in one's, you know, personal and professional journey is a credit score something that they need to be thinking about versus, you know, actively working towards? A fantastic question because I feel majority of the people today don't track their credit scores. And it is only when they approach a bank and the bank declines them the loan or s charges them an extra interest rate, then they realize that their just credit score is bad. That at some point of time there was some bank uh, payment that has not gone on time and that is why it's getting reflected or there was some place where they were a guarantor or there was some loan which they have forgotten but the credit score is reflecting. I personally, uh, whenever clients come to us, I first ask them that, uh, have you checked your latest credit score? And uh, they say, no, why? And I say, just go and check because they're the same credit card issues. You get a call on your phone and you tell, okay, fine, send me a credit card. And somebody sends you a credit card and there could be three, four credit cards, though you're not using, but they're lying in your drawer. And that could impact your credit score because it's showing that you're using or you're at least availing of those credit cards. Or those credit card companies are hitting your credit score and checking what is your credit score availability. At a professional and personal level, I personally say you should keep a track of your credit score as frequently as you take care of your health. And actually in finance, personal finance specifically, at a, as a person, we normally take care of more of our health rather than our wealth. So we may spend you know, daily half an hour, 45 minutes walking, jogging to try and you know, reduce my blood pressure, sugar, whatever, or to remain fit. But I will not spend 15 days or uh, 15 minutes in a week or maybe a half an hour in a month to understand what my business is doing, to understand the finance I'm talking. I'm not talking of the hands ground manufacturing what is happening. I'll be running behind orders, I'll be running behind suppliers, and I'll be just getting into a loop. I'm not having a grip on the finances. And as uh, we deal with uh, small businessmen, we deal with SMEs, we deal with uh, salaried people, we have seen this as a major problem. They don't have a grip on their finances. And when they don't have a grip, that is when the whole situation starts. Then you are more credit hungry. Mm -hmm. Then you start approaching banks for more loans. And that is where your credit scores are getting impacted very, very badly. Yeah. And as a professional or as a person, you need to be very, very, uh, very well aware that today, you know, 10, 15 years back, you didn't have a credit score in this country. Then Sybil came in. And now you have four of them, if I'm not mistaken. Right. And all four of them keep upgrading their systems on a daily basis is what I'm seeing with that. So one month you miss a payment at your bank and the next month your credit score is getting impacted. This kind of a situation coming in, you have to be, you know, you have to be on your toes to understand that you're not defaulting on any other payments and your credit score remains intact for your credit facilities to give you the better rates. There is no point in cribbing and saying that the bank is not giving me a loan. 
Your bank is not giving you a loan because your, either your financial documents are not in place and you're not having a grip on your finances. That's the biggest problem. Phenomenal. Now I'd uh, like to open the floor. For if there is any Q&A from our audience, uh, then we can, we can certainly have Balveer answer any questions that you may have. According to you as a financial expert, what is still the best solution for investing? Is it still the share market or there is some new uh, you know, trend wherein you can invest and uh, even if you are a risk taker, you can get more returns? So there is no best investment and there is no worst investment. Let me put it this way. So what suits you does not suit me and what suits me does not suit her. It's as simple as that. So you may want, uh, for you the best investment could be cryptocurrency, if I may name it. For me it would be probably a bank FD. So it all depends on what's your goal, ambitions, what is it that you're uh, you're striving for. So best investment and worst investment is always looked at from a returns perspective, if I put it that way. I would say it should not be looked at it that way. Your, your investments are purely for achieving some goal or the other. Whether it may be after 10 years you want to retire, you want to be financially free. In 5 years, 10 years, that's your goal and you should strive for that. Returns will come along the way. It will happen. Your goal should be clear with what you want and why you want it. So the moment you have that clarity, you will automatically strive towards achieving that goal and it will happen. So within that, it has to be purely asset allocation and it will not be that you should be, you know, it should not be that your only one player is playing the full match. You need to have a full diversified team. You need to have a fastballer, you need to have a spinner, you need to have a wicketkeeper, you need to have a striker, you need to have an opening batsman. Similarly, in your portfolio, you need to have practically all these aspects which take care of every situation. And you don't know which asset class is going to perform when. 2019 end or 20 start, somebody would have asked me, I would have said sit to equity. Market falls and they, then you probably start thinking whether you should be right or wrong. And then you still keep on, either you are exited or you are inside it. But if you are doing your asset allocation right at every point of time, either yourself or you are monitoring your wealth, then you will take asset allocation calls automatically. And once you do asset allocation, then this returns concept will get away. Because then you are automatically doing things which are needed to be done. Balveer has made it very tangible, very relatable, and the cricket analogy never hurts. So with that, thank you. A huge round of applause, Balveer. <laughs> Completely out of time then on tonight's episode. If you have any feedback for us, do let us know. Our contact details on your screens as we speak. Thanks for watching. Have a good night.